castles are our most dramatic landmarks from the Middle Ages, built as monuments to domination and power. Scattered all over the Irish landscape, these ancient buildings with their soaring walls and great towers leave you in no doubt about their military and defensive purpose. Just hope we brought a ladder. The Anglo-Norman aristocrats who invaded Ireland in the 12th century built their castles to control and intimidate the unruly Irish. As English rule was consolidated, the castles served as administrative centres, garrisons and jails, as well as lavish homes for the English lords. In this series, I'll be telling you stories about dramatic sieges, bloody battles, lavish lifestyles, ghostly presences, warring families and feudal lords. After all, the history of Irish castles is the history of Ireland itself. History is not really my thing. I didn't keep it up in school. I didn't know that Dublin had been a walled city, nor did I realise that all our castles were built by the same bunch, those guys called the Anglo-Normans, the descendants of the French from Normandy that conquered England at the Battle of Hastings in 1066 and became the ruling elite. At the time, the Irish would have been living in Ringforts, basically, um, stone houses in Ringforts a lot of the time. The landscape of Ireland is dotted with ring forts. Um, these are the fortified residences of, of the local aristocracy, the big farmers. Living alongside the native Irish, we had the Vikings. Those big fellas from Scandinavia had been around for 300 years and controlled the trading ports of Limerick, Wexford, Waterford, and most importantly of all, Dublin. So, Pat, take me back to Viking Dublin. What was it like? Oh, <laughs> an incredibly cramped city, a smelly city, a noisy city, a busy city. Manufacturing going on. They were even making new longboats here. The big battleships of the Viking fleet were made in Dublin because we'd oak forests all around the city. So apart from the, the, the heavy levels of manufacturing, it's still the same and it's still noisy and smelly. <laughs> the importance of the Viking towns cannot be overstated really because those who controlled a Viking town could become powerful and wealthy. Dublin of course was always the big prize. So this was the edge of the city. And these walls here are actually built by the Vikings. We're walking on what was once the River Liffey which almost came up and lapped against these so walls. So the Liffey actually came up to here? It did. 12th century Ireland was a hodgepodge of warring clans and regional kings all trying to assert power. Two main rivals of the day were Rory O'Connor, the High King of Ireland, and Dermot McMurrah, King of Leinster. Oh, well, Dermot McMurrah was King of Leinster and he was um, widely acknowledged as, as um, really a despot. Dermot, uh, of course, gets a very bad press as the guy who, uh, who invited the Normans into Ireland. But, of course, Derm Dermot was very much a man of his time. In 1167, a bloody feud saw Dermot stripped of his kingship, but rather than just throw in the towel, he sailed off to England seeking help from King Henry II. Initially, Henry didn't want to get directly involved, but he did give Dermot permission to look for support from his fighting elite, the powerful knights. One such knight was the Welsh Richard de Clare, known to all of us as Strongbow. Dermot offered Strongbow lands, his daughter Aoife in marriage, and so eventually his kingship in return for help. And so a deal was struck. Richard Fitzgilbert de Clare, he's the Earl of Pembroke in Wales. He is uh, the son of a very famous Norman family who were down on their luck a wee bit. They backed the wrong side in the English Civil War um, earlier in the 12th century. He's looking to make money and he's looking to get away from the overlordship of the King of England. And Dermot McMurrah arrives at just the right time because Strongbow needs to get out of England and make a name for himself. And he does exactly that when he takes the Kingdom of Leinster. The plan was to invade Ireland via the southeast before moving on to Dublin. The Anglo-Norman mercenaries, with their knights on horseback and skilled archers, were the most technologically advanced army of the time. The Irish wouldn't know what hit them. These guys were extremely well-trained 
and trained to fight as units, as militarised units. When William the Conqueror invaded England in 1066, his Norman soldiers brought with them loads of newfangled fashions. The lance, the kite shield, and the very height of fashion, chainmail. All of this sorted out the English at the Battle of Hastings in 1066, just like they sorted us out 100 years later. It's actually quite remarkable. There's very few men involved in the initial landing. The, the, the secret to fighting war in many cases is to win the psychological uh, battle. So if you arrive and you look intimidating um, and you scare the enemy, you've actually won the battle at that stage. The enemy doesn't want to fight you. Irish people would never have seen knights on horseback. They wouldn't have seen men with bows and arrows, their organisation, their building skills, their horsemen. It was just something that they had never come across before. So the combination of archery and horses, which were basically the medieval tanks, um, they had huge success. So here he is, the guy that we all blame for the 800 years of oppression. You see, I was listening that day in school. But the truth of the matter was that Strongbow wasn't really representing the English crown. The first invasion was more of a, a big family enterprise where everybody was working on a freelance basis. Strongbow was offered a really good deal though. He was offered a title, a pretty young girl, some land and some cold hard cash. Now it was going to be a high risk venture. I mean he wins the battle and he collects the prize or he loses the battle and goes home with nothing or more than likely gets killed in the attempt. Kind of a high-risk version of deal or no deal, really. In May 1169, they landed near Banno Bay. Wexford was the first Viking town to fall. Taking Waterford would be the next part of the strategy. The attackers managed to uh, pull down part of the wall and enter through the breach and just slaughtered everything that came near them. Reginald's Tower in Waterford was at the time a wooden Viking structure, and it was here that Strongbow executed the last Viking king of the city. Within several years, the conquerors would replace it with this stone tower, stout, solid and indestructible. With its ten feet thick walls, Reginald's Tower was impenetrable and a potent symbol of what was to come. These stone buildings were to become the hallmark of the Anglo-Norman invasion. And within 30 years, they would command the landscape from Waterford to Belfast Lock and west to the banks of the Shannon. With the southeast taken, it was time for all the conquering knights to opt for a wedding. Invitations were sent out and suits were hired and polished for the event of the year, the marriage of Strongbow and 25-year-old Aoife, Princess of Leinster. You see, the Irish aristocracy were marrying off their daughters to other aristocrats, you know, from time immemorial. Uh, Daniel McAleese's painting of, of the scene is uh, probably rather a romanticised image. I'm sure they cleared all the bodies away before the bride walked down the aisle. No, she wouldn't have got married surrounded by hordes of bodies and weeping women. That's not the way it would have happened. But I think it would have also sent out, very clearly sent out the signal that these guys were here to stay. They weren't just going to sort of rob the cattle and head home. These guys were, were in Ireland to stay. And that, I'm sure, would have sent a chill down many a spine. King Henry didn't like Strongbow to begin with. So when he heard that Strongbow was going native, swanning around the place, marrying Irish princesses and calling himself the King of Leinster, but well, then it was time to act. So in 1171, Henry arrived with 400 ships packed with horses and men and enough supplies to do the lot of them. Must have taken them ages to pack. Henry was the first English king ever to set foot in Ireland and his presence put Strongbow back in his place. Together they moved north with Dublin in their sights. As Strongbow his men moved out from Waterford, um, their better equipment, the use of cavalry allowed them a huge advantage over the Irish um, and they were able to, to, to dominate uh, any skirmishes that came along. And very quickly uh, overran, I suppose, most of Leinster. And they then moved on Dublin. Back then, 
Controlling Dublin was the key. You see, Dublin was a thriving Viking town. It minted coins and the locals paid taxes. And from here, the Vikings traded up and down the channel, north to Scandinavia and south to Spain and France. So when the Normans arrived, capturing Dublin was really important. I mean, troops from England could be dropped here at any moment and then dispatched north, west or south, or wherever they needed to kick ass. Realising what was afoot, the Irish finally pulled together under Rory O'Connor, the High King of the day. But unfortunately, not the best man for the job. Just a pity for Ireland that uh, probably the least effective of all the O'Connors in terms of military leadership was High King at the time of the Anglo-Norman invasion. He's not the guy I would have voted for. With 10,000 troops grouped around Dublin, the city waited for the Anglo-Normans to arrive. So you see, Rory wasn't the brightest, bless him. He thought he'd blocked all the roads coming into Dublin from the south, so he amassed his army out in Clondalkin. For some reason, he was expecting them to arrive that way. But you see, Dermot, he knew all the roads in Leinster, and why wouldn't he? He was the king of Leinster. So he marched the army over the mountains and came in through Glendalough. <laughs> So one morning, the people of Dublin woke up and the Normans were at the gate. Game over. The invading army came rushing over the city walls, massacring any resistance on their way and taking the timber Viking fortress at its centre. They were in. They were in, but there were many attempts to get them out. Uh, the High King of Ireland uh, did his best, surrounded the city with about 10,000 troops, but the Normans defeated them. The Vikings made one attempt to take back the city. They failed. So, but life went on. I mean, the tradespeople of the city were still doing their trades. Imports, exports went on just the same. The Viking ships were still used for, you know, uh, goods, bringing them in, bringing them out. And uh, the Vikings themselves just moved from one side of the city, they went from the south side to the north side. So nothing much changed? N not an awful lot changed. Not at first, at any, uh, at any rate. The citizens didn't see that much difference yet. The conquering force identified the site of the Viking citadel as the best spot for their defence of castle. Initially, they had to make do with a modern bailey structure. It would be nearly 40 years later before they would acquire the land and begin building the large defensive walls and towers that would make up Dublin Castle. When Dermot McMurrow went off to England looking for hired muscle, he unleashed an invasion that would see the eventual conquest of Ireland and bring about our first ever building boom. Strongbow, with his battle-hardened mercenaries and superior firepower, quickly overran the lands east of the Shannon. Power would now be managed through a network of defensive castles, the likes of which had never been seen before in Ireland. The Anglo-Norman regime of castle building had begun. And the Irish had, had simply blown it. O'Connor had, had, had simply blown it, and the Hiberno Norse had, had blown it. When the Anglo-Normans established their castle in Dublin, it would be 1922 before the city would rule its own affairs again. The political landscape was changed forever. Right, so we're now entering St. Patrick's Hall, the most important room in Dublin Castle. This is the function room. It is indeed, and this is where we have the presidential inauguration and all of our state banquets for visiting royalty and visiting heads of state. Look at the ceiling. I know, the ceiling is amazing. So what are we looking at? It's the submission of the Irish chieftains in 1169. The submission of the Irish yes, chieftains? Yes, when they submitted to Henry II, the King of England. So you have them there lining up in front, ready to hand the country over. Um, it Just is, like that. Well, it is obviously a romantical representation of what happened, but within a year or two, yeah, they had all submitted. And, of course, they're all dressed in armour and the Irish are... And the Irish aren't, no, exactly. Yeah, it was they're again, day wear. Yeah, it's yeah. a representation that they were considered, you know, lower status, lower class. Um, they were almost considered to be savages in comparison to the English. And who's the gentleman that handed it well, to? Well, that's the infamous King Henry II. Right. Yeah, so he was the one that um, Dermot went to to have permission for Strongbow to come and to interfere in our matters. And also Henry II is the father of the very famous uh, Richard the Lionheart and John I. And John I was the one that built Dublin Castle and built the very first castle here on this site. For the English crown to hold on to power in Ireland, they needed a network of loyal subjects to defend its interests. So the land was parcelled out to the favoured knights and the great land grab began. 
I think what the, what the Anglo-Norman magnates were most interested in was ensuring that they grabbed whatever land was on offer to them and that they could fortify it and, and keep that land uh, in their possession. They start building all along the East Coast. I mean, they start building fairly early on in Dublin as well. Um, certain, what, they, what they do is erect motts and baileys at key points, usually key crossing points at rivers and places like that. It was about uh, dominating the landscape. Uh, by putting a castle down, you're saying we're here for the long term. Whenever the Normans moved in, they built a fortification. And the initial castles that they built were of earth and stone and timber. And from that initial kind of uh, fortified area, they would then build a stone castle. And then very quickly, it takes on the manner of English living. Before Henry left Ireland, he tried to put a system in place that would prevent future acts of rebellion. Increasingly wary of Strongbow, especially since his marriage to Aoife and then German's death in 1171 had made Strongbow King of Leinster, Henry began dividing out the land to other trusted knights as a way of keeping him in check. Henry II was rather worried that Strongbow would become the King of Ireland. Like, you always had to be worried in medieval times. You might get stabbed in the back, or you might get poisoned or beheaded or whatever it was. So he needed a counterbalance against Strongbow, and that counterbalance was Hugh de Lacey. Hugh de Lacey was not one of Strongbow's original gang from Wales. Loyal to Henry, now calling himself Lord of Ireland, de Lacey was rewarded with huge tracts of land north of Dublin and the titles Lord of Meath and Chief Governor. As with any great Anglo-Norman lord, he is trying to stamp his authority on his new kingdom. I mean, he's been given the kingdom of Meath, but he has to conquer it. I mean, it's, Henry II handed it to him, but it wasn't his. He had to actually win it. Hugh de Lacey built what was to be one of the first and the finest baronial castles in either Ireland or England. A trim, ca trim castle for me is just amazing. I think it's really imposing. No other castle is anything like Trim. It was a fortress really on the European scale. As a dub, I hate to say this, but County Meath has the best and most impressive Norman castle in Ireland. You see, as a lord, it wasn't important that you had a castle with 22 arrow loops, a couple of baileys, lots of gates, three ensuite garda robes, which of course are toilets, a curtain wall and a great hall. But it sure did make you look good. At the time, this magnificent structure was the most imposing building in the land. Built on a hill above the River Boyne, its massive wall was studded with seven towers and two heavily defended gates. You can see why they shot the movie Braveheart here. De Lacey picked Trim because it was on the River Boyne and he had easy access to the medieval port in Drogheda so he could bring supplies up. Rivers were the highways, medieval highways. I mean, if you think of trying to get a, a wagon load of pottery from Dublin to Trim uh, in the medieval period, it was much, much safer to put it on a boat if it got there intact. This is the area here is where the Boyne River flowed in against the base of the curtain walls. And this is where they were able to moor the flat bottom boats that came up from the port in Drogheda bringing supplies to the castle. De Lacey's original castle was a timber construction, surrounded by a defensive ditch perched up on the hill. But they soon began work on the permanent and impressive stone keep. I mean, the Irish had never seen the likes of that before. Next was the curtain wall, and that created this huge outer yard area, or bailey. Now, the bailey is where you would have found the soldiers' quarters, workshops, stables, various peasants, or, of course, animals for the kitchen. It's a very impressive setup. And for hundreds of years, Trim Castle was impregnable. It was a real special thing about it is this keep. 
It's a completely unique plan and layout. Um, it's the keep itself is more uh, an exercise in geometry really than defence. The defence of, of the castle is really in its, its outer walls, but it's a com just completely unique plan for the keep, which makes it really special. You big dramatic looking keep in the middle of your castle which was probably painted white or whitewashed with these big galleries around it fighting platforms at the top and then red tile roof so it was something like out of Disneyland incredibly impressive which you could have seen from all around here. But what's interesting I think about Trim is that we're seeing this a change in fortification at a very early date and it shows you that ideas passed very quickly in uh, the medieval world. People like Hugh de Lacey who built Trim are moving between England, Wales and France, maybe further afield. And so in one sense, Trim is at the forefront of castle design, I would think, in late 12th century Europe. Trim was the most impressive castle in the land by a mile. It's one of the finest examples of an Anglo-Norman castle in all of Europe. Situated on the outer edge of the pale, it became the administrative centre, the bastion of the English crown. And because of this, along with Dublin Castle, it was constantly upgraded and refurbished to reflect its royal status. Well, this is the, the north side of the, of the keep. Um, even on a sunny day, it's, it's a cold side. So the tower that was here was a service tower. The other towers were for accommodation. In the keep, there's no well. And to, of course, a castle has to have water. In times of siege, you need water. So uh, right from the start, there's an ingenious system of gathering all the water that comes off the roofs. It's fed through a series of ducts and pipes and into, the, into this north tower here. But the interesting thing about the tower, though, and the kitchens is that we also found the waste from the actual kitchens as well and from the table. And we have a fantastic um, collection of animal and bird bones um, from, from those kitchens. And, of course, there would have been great medieval feasts in here. I mean, they went to town on, on, on these big presentations on big occasions. And one of the things they actually would have done was they would have taken a swan, stuffed it with a goose, stuffed the goose with a pheasant, stuffed the pheasant with a duck, stuffed the duck with a dove, stuffed the dove with a pit, something else, and sometimes up to 12 different birds. And This is the sort of carry-on you get, but we, we had it all from over this side of the castle. We found all the bones, we sieved all the soil, and we found the smallest fish bones and bird bones, so we know exactly what they were eating. It was kind of hard to run a castle back in those days. I mean, you had the lord, his knights, their squires, your missus, her maids, a couple of servants, priests. I mean, if they all turned up, <laughs> after a couple of weeks of them all going for the toilet down the chute into a ditch, the place would stink. I mean, really stink. So the Lord would say, ha, ah, let's get out of here. And he'd head up the road to one of his other castles. The smell must have been absolutely horrendous in the middle of, of summer. So he might scoot off back to Dublin and get them to fumigate the place and clean it up, or go off to Drogheda or go to Durrow, or go to Clonmacnoise, or somewhere else, before it became befouled as well. So they moved around a fair amount, and he brought his retinue with them. It's, it's different. You know, Ireland is a frontier society. Ireland is, is rough, essentially. I mean, it's difficult. Um, I've come across many instances of women writing to the king to ask if they could essentially swap their Irish lands for some in England because it's just too much trouble. So it, it is difficult. I mean, life in an Irish castle for a woman in the 12th and 13th centuries would not have been easy. There's very few creature comforts. It's a rough, soldierly kind of life. This is the only fireplace that they had for the first 20 years. The chimney, which is spiral, still in good condition. The mantle area has gone. Down to the grid, you can see the outline of the hearthstone. Now, these wall niches behind, these were part of the built-in furniture of the day. They were similar to a press or a cupboard in today's terms. They were also used as wall lights by placing candles inside in the niches and stretching a sheep's stomach upon a wooden frame across it as a lampshade for effect. Uh, well, this is the original seat of the window. This is one of the windows of the Great Hall. You could have sat here, you would have a lovely big window. Um, these big windows are only, only here on the riverward side of the castle because it's got a defence and allowed you to swing either side and, and fire arrows. Very often the crossbows were used here as opposed to longbows because they're easier to use in a small place like this. They were experts at building castles. I mean, even the stairs are well thought out. You see how they go around clockwise? See, that gives the advantage to the right-handed swordsman coming from above because the right-handed swordsman coming from down here 
wouldn't be able to wiggle his weapon without hitting the centre post. You see, everything about these castles made them hard to take. But no Irishman, no native of this country would ever have attempted to try and get into Trim because it's too well defended. Just doesn't make sense. Trim Castle would be the centre of English power for decades. But beyond the pale, it was bandit country, where the Irish lords still held sway. There, there is this feeling that somehow the Anglo-Normans came in, they came, they saw, they conquered. No, there's, there's masses of the country, there's parts of the country you can't travel through if you're English because you will be attacked. Large parts of Ireland were not conquered and the native Irish lords were left in place. There's two, it's like two worlds. It's, it's not an overall kind of uniform culture. It's two very distinct cultures side by side. They often clash. As the Normans settled in, life in Dublin returned to normal. Strongbow hadn't lasted very long. He died in Dublin in 1176, and power in the city settled down under the control of the crown. So as the Normans settled in then, Pat, into life in Dublin, what was it like back then for the, for the Dubliners? Well, first of all, the Normans brought regulation into the city. A bit of order. A bit of order. And new charters, new laws came in from the King of England. The city expanded. The trade with England increased. It was actually a great place to be in. The, the population increased, except you had to be in the city. And what sort of population are we talking about now? Then? Oh, it went up to around 10,000. So maybe it's a silly question, but obviously then what was the relationship like between the ordinary Dubliners and the people who populated the castle? <laughs> well, the ordinary Dubliner at this stage was, was really... Uh, if you're talking about the Irish, yeah. they were allowed to work here in the daytime, but not to sleep here at nighttime. They had to get out and go to places like Irishtown or Ringsend. They weren't trusted to be here at nighttime. Right. This became an English city. It was Irish outside of the city, it was English inside the walls. The striking aspect of the Anglo-Norman settlement is the fact that the Gaelic Irish were excluded from their legal code. So the Gaelic Irish had no protection under the English common law. So you could kill an Irish man and not have to answer for it. So this obviously put Gaelic people within the common law area of influence at a severe disadvantage. Within the walls, the Anglo-Normans developed the city, built churches and handed over trade to the merchants from Bristol. But to keep control, they needed to update their timber fort. They had to build a castle here, but Dublin was a shambles. I mean, it was a small, pokey, dirty little town with wooden houses and smelly lanes. I mean, it took them years to requisition the lands alone, so they were never going to be able to build some massive structure like, say, Trim with its impressive keep and its big curtain wall that measured over a quarter of a mile. Dublin Castle was always a dingy garrison and it housed the sheriff, his troops and, of course, his tax collectors. Money was what it was all about and Dublin became a cash cow for the English crown. Taxes went out of Ireland into the English exchequer. So, the activities of the English king was a constant drain on the manpower and wealth of the Anglo-Norman colony in Ireland. For example, there's a tax you pay when you get married, there's a tax you pay when you die. So there's a, there's a whole system designed. If they had towns in their lands, there's a lot of tolls that people would pay. In fact, throughout the Middle Ages, Ireland was a very coin-poor economy. There weren't a lot of coins in circulation, simply because they were paid to London. It wouldn't be until King Henry's son, John, took over that Dublin Castle really prospered. But all around the country, castles were being built. There was money to be made with every opportunist trying to mark out his territory. Just eight years after Strongbow's invasion that established the Anglo-Norman strongholds in Cork, Waterford, Wexford, Dublin and Trim, John de Courcy, who was a member of that garrison in Dublin, well, he decided to go on a bit of a solo run. So he decided to head north and he arrived in Carrickfergus in 1177. So that was the perfect place to build a castle, wasn't it? John de Courcy built his castle at Carrickfergus with commanding views of Belfast Lock. He did, however, build it without any permissions from the king. It was a perfect location, far enough from Dublin for a maverick knight to be able to assert his power yet easily defended from both land and sea. 
as you were. So Rory, in terms of what we can see in front of us today, and in terms of De Corsi, where did he start? Well, he came up, he was in the garrison in Dublin, and in 1177 he came up with 22 armed knights and 300 foot soldiers, and he carved out a semi-independent kingdom for himself in Ulster, and he based himself here in Carrickfergus. Well, at some point, one of the military architects must have said to him, <clears throat> it's out in a rock, are you mad? Look, look at the coastline <laughs> over there, build it over there. Well, of course he would have said to him, <clears throat> build it over where there's a natural spring so that we have water yeah. all the year round for put under siege. Um, the promontory it's sitting on is easily defendable. It's on the coast, which means uh, De Courcy could have kept in touch with uh, both his father-in-law, who was the, the king of the Isle of Man, he was yeah. married to his daughter, and also to Cumbria, where he was from. So it was all very well chosen, and there's a natural harbour beside as well for boats to come in and supply if needs be. And um, you can see how impressive it looks. It would have been visible from land and sea for miles. Uh, you could have guards on top looking out, etc. and it would have been a real statement of power. He, he wasn't here for long, was he? He, he wasn't. He started minting his own coins. Um, he was known as Prince of Ulster, although he didn't have that official title. And uh, he, was, he had basically a kingdom of his own, and King John started to get very annoyed with him. And he, uh, <laughs> he sent another Norman knight, yeah. Hugh de Lacey, uh, up. Uh, to uh, get rid of de Courcy and in 1205 de Courcy was expelled and Hugh de Lacy took over. These fellas all just got notions themselves and said I fancy a bit of this and I'm going to build my own place. Well they absolutely did and uh, up in County Antrim which is quite far away from the centre of power in Dublin you could carve out a kingdom and once you'd subdued the, the local Irish you could then do things like mint your own coins and, and uh, rule like a king. Once de Lacy took Carrick Fergus and brought it back under the control of the crown, King John looked to extend his power west. And this time, he would make sure that he called the shots from the start. Limerick was still a Viking, spe uh, Norse-speaking town up to the time that they, the Normans arrived. And if you were going to Take, take the country, you needed to take the town. Uh, it's 1175 when the Normans first arrive. It's an important, an important city to hold. I mean, if, if you have, have Limerick, you, 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 know, you can control what's going on up and down the Shannon. Eventually, uh, King John builds what's now known as King John's Castle. John never actually made it to Limerick but it's called King John's Castle because it's a royal castle. It was built by royal decree, and um, it was a substantial castle. There was a large amount of money spent on it. We have a record of 1211, 1212, that um, about 700 pounds was spent on the castle, and that is an absolutely colossal amount in those days, um, equivalent of a major inf piece of infrastructure today um, that might cost billions. John was a bit suspicious of a lot of his uh, barons, and so rather than handing over uh, Munster to his barons and letting them divvy it up amongst themselves, he actually created a centre of his own in Limerick so that he had a power base in the area as well. Uh, and I think that that's why um, King John you know, established the castle, because he, he was just simply afraid of um, the baron, his own barons, going off on a, their own tack. Limerick Castle was another key centre, and it was established not as an isolated outpost, but as one of the biggest and most secure military bases in the whole country. And as well as building the castle, they developed Limerick into another one of Ireland's walled cities. Alongside Watford and Dublin, it developed a system of English laws and charters, all administered from within the imposing fortress of a castle. Well, the Anglo-Norman incursions into Ireland at the end of the 12th century and into the 13th went tremendously well. Um, the mid-13th century saw the colony at the height of its power. Um, it had sway over quite a lot of the island, you could say most. As the 13th century progressed, Ireland really became two separate countries, the so-called lands of peace, where the English were in control, and the lands of war, where the Irish still ran their own affairs. The knights who did strike out west survived by marrying into the local clans and going native. As you head west uh, from, say, Dublin, once you go outside the Pale area, it does become 
um, it does become more Gaelic. It's never, it's not wholly Gaelic. There are always interactions with neighboring Anglo-Norman families, but certainly as you go into the West, as you cross the Shannon, it would become, uh, the English influence will become a lot less pronounced. The Irish just seem to have gotten on with, with their traditional way of life. And if anything, rather than the Irish being drawn into the Anglo-Norman the Anglo world, it was the Anglo-Normans were drawn into the, into, the, into the Irish world. On the banks of Loch Corrib, Ashford Castle is one of the most beautiful castles in Ireland. It was established by the Anglo-Norman knight, William de Burgo, who had been governor of Limerick before striking out west. Like many of the knights, he would marry well. His wife was the daughter of the King of Thomond, and this alliance allowed the de Burgos to become the most powerful family in Connacht. The de Burgos would have built their tower to watch over Loch Corrib and to protect themselves from the native O'Connor clan. Now, the de Burgos were a proud family of knights from Wales who fought at the Battle of Hastings. So with their chain mail and archers, they quickly won the day here, becoming the ruling family of most of Connacht, and they established the walled town in Galway. But their allegiance to the crown was a little half-hearted. By the 14th century, they had become more Irish than the Irish themselves. I mean, it's all well and good, you know? Standing here in the glorious sunshine, with protective gear all over you, not a breath of wind, shooting at a plastic target. But I'll tell you something, you're standing on the top of a keep with a 60 mile an hour horizontal wind and 300 fellas shooting arrows up at you. That's a different ball game, isn't it? Apparently back in the day, if an archer was captured, it was a particularly gruesome thing that the enemy would do to them. Well, if they didn't chop off their heads, they would chop off their fingers so they couldn't pull back the... That's it, so that's the... So they were rendered useless. They were rendered useless. Tell me you got that one. <laughs> With its gallery of colourful owners, Ashford Castle, now a five-star hotel, gives us a microcosm of 700 years of Irish history. In the 17th century, after 350 years under the de Burgos, the estate had passed to the Oranmore and Brown family the descendants of the de Bruins, who had helped with the initial conquering of Connacht and had built their castle in Galway. The Browns held on to Ashford Castle until 1852, uh, when they were forced to sell up the greater part of their lands. Uh, like a lot of landlords by that stage, they were hopelessly in debt. They had already been uh, very extravagant, but the Famine uh, in the second half of the 1840s pushed them and a lot of other landlords over the edge because they weren't getting in any rents. So they had very little income, but they already had large debts to service. So uh, this organization called the Est Encumbered Estates Court was established. It was really the Nama of its day, precisely to take over responsibility for these indebted estates and to sell them on. Um, and at this period, you then had a man called Sir Benjamin Lee Guinness, who was perhaps the greatest businessman of his era in charge of the Guinness Brewery. And he was looking for an estate, a shooting estate in the west of Ireland, and it was in 1852 that he then discovered Ashford, Ashford House, as it was called at the time, and bought that. It was Arthur Guinness who made the big changes on the house. In the fashion of the day, he employed the same architect as nearby Kylemore Abbey, which was built by another wealthy industrialist. Gothic revival was in, and it made spectacular statements for wealthy men who wanted to be linked to the romance of the past. So, no longer for defence, what was once called Ashford House now became Ashford Castle, smothering the original de Burgo Tower. Ashford Castle, well, that was just now for decoration. The Guinness family were renowned for both their good work in the area as well as their famous shooting parties. Local man Martin Gibbons is the maitre d' and the third generation of his family to work in the castle. 
But of course, your your family association with the with the castle goes goes back. I mean, you, it goes back. It goes back to my grandfather's time, and Martin Gibbons as well. He worked here in the early 1900s with the Guinnesses. He was a gamekeeper on the estate. Gamekeepers were, I was led to believe, they were they were gods in Guinness's eyes. They looked after the estate. They were shooting woodcock during the winter months with their parties and their guests at the house. And they came during the summer to fish. And this was just their country estate. Their main residence was in Dublin, as we all know. It's not bad, is it? No, not bad. It's not a bad little country part to have. Not, no, no. The last room the Guinness built on was uh, now our Prince of Wales cocktail bar. It was built from the visit of George V, who was here in 1905. So your grandfather would have been working here at that time. He worked here in the yes. In so he would have met. He would have met the. He would have met George V. He was on the shooting party when they shot at Ballykine Woods, west of here near Clonmore. The estate at that time was 28,000 acres. It was all the land between Loch Cora, which you have here, and Loch Mask, which is a mile north of here. And of course, they would have came into when the Guinnesses came up to the estate. They probably would have come into Galway, would they? Into Galway, they sailed south around the south coast into Galway Bay, left their boats there and then they took their yachts from Galway to here. Must have been great times, like. Anywhere they went, anywhere Guinnesses went, they left great monuments after them. So you had George V stay here. But in the latter part of the last century, you had a very famous visitor as well because a very famous piece of Irish history happened here. A very famous movie was shot That's right, in 1951. Yeah. Yes, in 1939, Ashford became a hotel. It was changed into a hotel by the Hugger family. And then in 1951, the, the film The Quiet Man was made here. John Ford, director, and Maureen O'Hara, and John Wayne as, yes. Mr. Swagger himself. A and did they stay in the hotel? They stayed for the six weeks, really? yes, yeah. A story, um, a story that Maureen O'Hara, and she used to tell us the stories about John Ford and a ban on alcohol in filming in 1951. Did he really? He did, yes. Because yeah. Mr. Wayne liked a little... He dropped, yes. Didn't yeah, he? Yeah. So Ford but, said to him, right, no drinking no and drinking. shoot. For the entire shoot? Yes. Ah, he must have had a sneaky one. Do you honestly think that they adhered to that drinking ban for the I 60s? I don't think so. Either. I don't think so either. <laughs> I don't think so. It's still talked about today, no matter for the right work at breakfast or dinner in the evening. Somebody will always bring up some part of the film. By the middle of the 13th century, the Anglo-Normans had established their presence across large swathes of the country. Now, their control would be consolidated under the great earldoms, powerful dynasties of knights who managed huge territories on behalf of the crown. And the richest and most powerful would be William Marshall, the greatest knight of all time, who, by marrying Isabel, daughter of Strongbow and Aoife, forged an alliance that would see the pair become the most powerful couple in the British Isles. Mm -hmm.